uh, uh, you look for out for each other, you're compassionate with one another, and so on and so forth. So, and there's others who have compassion, they treat their wife or they treat their husband well, but they may not have that deep love, right? And they can live for maybe 30, 40, 50 years together, but they, you know, sometimes it's just not, they didn't really uh, uh, lock with each other. Um, so those two components are so beautiful and so beautifully stated in this ayah. And then our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, That, you know, uh, the marriage is from my way, is from my sunnah. Uh, our example, our model in every aspect of life is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, he he modeled in his life the most beautiful uh, marriage between between him and Sayyida Khadija, uh, and uh, and the Prophet said, he said, whoever turns away from my way, they're not from me. They're not following my way. They're not following my path. Right. So that's why marriage in Islam is a very 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 um, important uh, matter. And um, and our Prophet sallallahu he encouraged, and this is a encouragement that stands for all places, all times, all societies. Uh, the Prophet he said, "O oh, young people, um, whoever uh, is able from amongst you, whoever has emotional maturity, physical maturity, financial maturity, you're ready to get married." Get married, right? Get married. So the Prophet ﷺ encouraged this uh, for people. When you're at that age and you start, uh, you you know your your body is telling you that you need to get married, um, and you have whatever it takes to support somebody. Doesn't mean that you have a, a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar a year job. Doesn't mean you have to have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, and so those are good things. Those are obviously going to make you more stable, and so on and so forth. But some people, quite honestly, are ready to get married before that. And if they don't, um, it can be extremely difficult for them to maintain their chastity and maintain their modesty in the meantime. Right. So as parents, we have to think uh, 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 about those things while we're raising our kids. So those are just some very brief ref reflections that. Um, the, the, the Islamic basis for, for marriage. Um, and I'm talking about the benefits and the blessings of marriage. You know, we kind of touched upon it a little bit, you know, the companionship, navigating life's challenges together. Um, it's a foundation for uh, raising a family, uh, a source of, uh, uh, can be a great source of happiness, and it can be a great source of pain. And we, and we know that, uh, that divorce in Islam is allowed as well. So we know that that balance, uh, I mean, there is that, that exception and there is that, that, that out in the land. And then, alhamdulillah, this is a halal way for men and women to uh, uh, be intimate with one another and to enjoy that. Um, and it's important to see it that way. And it's interesting what uh, Suha was mentioning, love, you know, and rahmah uh, wa the love and, and, and mercy, that this is one of the reasons, this is kind of a non-scientific uh, uh, reasoning, but when, when a lot of young couples, and even a lot, you know, for a divorce rate in America is 50%. And so you hear this a lot of times, you know, I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. You know, or I fell out of love. But that's where well, uh, the, the, the rahmah comes into play. You know, you have that time, you know, and no matter what, you know, there will be a time when you have that giddy, that love feeling. But then there's like that deeper love that I do things because I love you. You know, it doesn't have to mean, you know, all the time that, you know, okay, we're going to go out to a movie and we're teenagers and we have kids and whatever. Um, but that um, when somebody makes a mistake, there's mercy, right? Somebody's not able to fulfill their part of their responsibilities for whatever reason. There's understanding, there's mercy. And that's what really creates a full uh, and blessed marriage. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the center of the marriage, you know, that is the reason why the marriage was founded upon. Wallahi, this makes for the most successful marriage. When both individuals go into the marriage saying, we are here to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whatever disputes we have, we take it back to the Lord and This makes for a successful marriage. And I think we can end on that. <laughs> um, but, uh, and when there are when there's issues with Rahman, when there's issues with love and mercy, 
you know, you're, you're, you're just clashing for some reason. Things are not working out. Uh, and that's when we ask Allah SWT for help. And Wallahi, Allah SWT will put that back into the marriage. You know, uh, very important um, to remember that always. That even when things look very bleak and you ask Allah SWT, and of course it is His will to continue the marriage or not, but um, and, and all of those efforts, when that sincere effort is made, Wallahi, uh, that is a possibility that for Allah to put that back into the marriage. So it's a constant relationship that goes three ways, Wallahi. It's you, your spouse, and number one, Allah SWT. Um, in terms of um, raising a, a family, I, I think you wait. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, raising the raising a family is um, uh, uh, so stressed in the Quran, uh, the focus of how that family should be raised, and the you know is exemplified in this du'a, right? ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إما that um, for our Lord uh, bestow upon us um, offspring. Uh, that will be the pleasure of our eyes, right? The comfort of our eyes. Um, our, our, um, our family members, our spouses and our children, we want them to always be uh, close to us, near to us. And we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill that within us. And uh, that, you know, you know, some people, some young people, um, when they get married, they struggle. Before they get married, they're looking. Uh, guys nowadays are extremely picky in terms of who they want to marry as far as looks are concerned. Um, overly conscious, they want to marry, you know, Miss Universe and he, he, he won't even pass for Miss, you know, he won't even be Mr. Street on his block where he lives, right? He couldn't even win the beauty contest like for two or three houses that he lives in, right? And he wants to marry Miss Universe. Um, uh, when you love someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when you come to someone for the right reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the Th that person in your eyes makes them look more beautiful than anybody else in this world, right? When you come to somebody for the right reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that person beautiful in your eyes. So when you look for somebody, you're looking here, you're not looking here, and you're not looking at the rest of their body, you're looking at what's inside of them, right? Because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at. Um, as our beloved Prophet he says, إن الله لا ينظر في سور في سوركم ولا سامكم ولكن ينظر في قلوبكم أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم الله أين الله الله is not looking at how you look and your shape and your form he's looking at what's inside right that's how Allah سبحانه وتعالى deems a person worthy or not right we know that that taqwa is that component that is going to put you in good shape with Allah Right? So look to people in the same way. Right? When you're trying to get married, you're looking for the same quality. You want to look at that quality which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at. So um, uh, uh, that should always be uh, the focus uh, for us pre-marriage. And then, of course, post-marriage, we're helping each other now develop that taqwa. Right? Now you're in a, a family of God consciousness where you're, you're working on that uh, together. Um, some interesting statistics on marriage, uh, and, and subhanAllah points to um, points to some interesting uh, facts. That happily married couples have a far lower rate of physical problems such as high blood pressure, heart disease, anxiety, and depression. You know, um, subhanAllah, not to underestimate the fact that stress is really a killer. You know, and, and it comes up in different forms, whether it be these diseases that are mentioned, people say it also can lead to cancer as well. So subhanAllah, it's really, really important if there are you know, couples that are struggling uh, uh, in the home and they're fighting, they're arguing really to take a step back and, and see, you know, this is not only good for our health because of these issues, it's also not good for our children as well. You know, because they're seeing you are the role model uh, for what they are going to be as husband and wife. Um, the rate of satisfaction in marriage, and this is really interesting, so a national poll, it's a national survey, is higher for husbands and wives when both regularly maintain religious attendance 
and feel that God is in the center of their marriage. This is a poll done by non-Muslims, uh, done over the whole nation. So it's very interesting. Again, so we said it, we know this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really the focal point of the marriage. And again, this stress, uh, this is stressed here as well in the survey, um, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the center of the marriage, then both husband and wife, they feel more uh, satisfaction. And it's also very interesting in terms of divorce. More than three-fifths of divorced Americans wish that they had worked on their marriage uh, harder to, to, to actually save it. Um, and again, so, subhanAllah, at the end of the day, it's no see. You made a sahara, you chose, you thought it's person was very God-conscious, and it doesn't work out, and it ends up in divorce. So that's not to point to a fault in a person when that happens. But, you know, again, when we talk about some of the shallow reasons, right, why people uh, uh, divorce one another, this really points to that. So again, it's to kind of remind those that are looking to get married to really take things seriously and to look at equality. Um, <laughs> and of course, there has to be people. When when uh, uh, was mentioning, um, it's really important to look at the heart and not just the outer appearance. We're really talking about setting the bar so high, becoming so picky. It has to be this size, and this hair color, eye color. Of course, there has to be acceptance, you know, so that there is some attraction. But again, not setting setting it as a model. Uh, we have to be super one. <clears throat> Any other? Okay. Any other points? Uh, I wanted to uh, jump in here, uh, and you know, for those of you that are married, and inshallah, those of you that are thinking about marriage, it's important to realize that marriage is not a status quo. It's not static. Just like you are not static. So how can you expect? Now there's two people involved, and of course then there's going to be children, and then there's the in-laws, and then there's you know all kinds of you know coworkers and, and friends and what have you. So all of those things are not static. How would a, a, a marriage be? So to take that for granted and to be like, oh, well, my wife is always this way, so I'm always going to continue this way, and I'm going to treat her this way, and same thing, my husband, we always do this, and it's okay, it's not a big deal, and to continue with that type of thought process can really create a losing situation. Uh, so anytime you analyze your relationship and you feel like things are not going well, I'm not happy, you know, my spouse, blah, 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 look at yourself first. What are you doing to contribute to the relationship? How is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's something you should be asking yourself. Not always to blame it on the, the spouse. When your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is correct, it's on the right track, you will feel barakah in everything. Not only in your spousal relationship at work, with the kids, so on and so forth. So that's something really uh, important. Also, your, the way that you feel about yourself. You know, what are you doing? And there's phases of life, right? There's maybe it's an early stage, maybe one, uh, maybe life is not working, Maybe your husband's not working in the beginning, you know, uh, maybe later when there's kids, there's a period of time when somebody's at home, maybe later in life. All those different times, you may start to internalize your own frustrations with yourself, perhaps, or your own life situation, and uh, um, reflect that onto your spouse. But maybe it's just that you're not happy with yourself. So that's something also to consider when you're reflecting upon the status of your relationship. Uh, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Are you hot-tempered? Uh, you know, are you sometimes aloof? It's easy for you to kind of get lost in your own self. Is there some kind of things that take you away from the family that maybe uh, could be a stressor to the household? So what are your strengths and weaknesses? Again, look at yourself first before you start really thrashing your spouse and, and putting them down. Um, and, and, and again, the beauty about Rahman and Mawadda, when there's mercy in the relationship, it can keep that love alive. When there's mercy, you realize uh, that the relationship it's not all about you, you know, it's two people, and, and, and realizing that, you know, people change. So, things went this way for five years, okay, well that person doesn't want to do that anymore, or they don't feel a certain way, you know, whatever it is. Um, I don't like this routine, they change, so you can't just feel like, well, this is not the way I, I found you when, you when I married you. Okay, well, people change, you know, uh, and usually it's not dramatic, but again, that flexibility, it's a constant reflection process. You know, marriage is not static, so uh, to expect that uh, to stay the same, it would be uh, foolish. Part, part of the problem is that uh, uh, women have certain expectations and men have certain expectations. And by the way, this is, uh, um, you know, talking about this issue of change. 
when 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 women marry men, uh, they expect them to change. Men don't change. <laughs> and and men when men marry marry women. Uh, they expect them to forever look beautiful, but they change, right? So there are some changes that take place. What are you trying to say? So uh, I think that was a bad. Okay, I, I, I yeah. just yeah. No, when they say women try to find the perfect man and change everything about them. I'm gonna laugh. Um, yes, yeah, please. Please. Say something. Nobody should expect the other. They can change somebody else, but we can compromise. You know, this is the this is the word. We need to compromise in order to get along with our differences and you know to reach a middle point. That's my understanding. Yes. Nobody can change anybody. Everybody in the relation, oh, I'm going to change him. He's going to change over the time. I can change her in my way. We are lying to ourselves. Nobody can change, but we need to compromise. Yes. Yes. Just accommodate. Uh, accommodate, you know, yes. to accommodate you. Yes. yes. And, and, and you feel satisfied when you feel like, okay, this time he gave in a little bit to me, but next time on this issue, it matters more to him on this issue. Yeah, I'm going to give in on this. So this... Give and take. You give and take, you yeah. feel like it's balanced. Yeah. Then that's a happy situation. Yeah. 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 And it's not also, and it's not tit for tat. It's, no. right, yeah. I did this, you did that. No, no it's, it's everything is flex, you know, yeah. everything is just constantly yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Although women have amazing yeah. memory of yeah. scorecards yeah. always keep track. <laughs> 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 But you don't get that when you first get married. That's you don't, the problem. You don't, How do you teach that to new couples that it all, you know, things change and when you first get married you're just trying to, to you know, change the other person. Yeah. And that's when the problems arise. Absolutely. It's quite a lot. And that's why I, I think it's very helpful. I know that um, uh, so Alhamdulillah when he was um, mm -hmm. doing marriages at the masjid, that he required, he talked about that just, just Kind of briefly mentioned that. Like you required that a couple before they get married, that they sit with you. And yeah, kind of it, helps, of you course. Um, it's important, you know, when you get married. It, Islamically, um, a man and woman should get to a, a point where they accept each other for what they are. They should know enough about each other that they feel comfortable with each other. Um, before they tie the knot. We live in a different generation than our parents, than others, uh, when, when people would, they would literally see each other uh, one time, if that, or on their parents' recommendation, and they would marry, right? We don't live in that time. We have, we're bombarded with so much media and so many images of what uh, uh, women are and uh, what men are and who they should be and what they should be like and also in the education system that we grow up in in the workplace uh, men and women interact freely and so on and so forth there were there was a, there were generations in the past when there wasn't the, that level education at least was uh, segregated to a large extent in many places uh, and so on and so forth so my point being that uh, it's important that two people get to know each other um, before they get married uh, and they're comfortable with uh, with one another. Of course, what does that level of how much they should get to know? It's a subjective thing. Uh, there's boundaries that one should follow before marriage. Uh, as long as those are considered and those are followed, uh, you're, you're, that's fine. Um, but the point is uh, uh, two people should know each other uh, and understand each other before they get married, and they should understand what their weaknesses of the other party is. You're not going to understand completely what their weaknesses are until you're together. Before marriage, it's a big show. Uh, you're putting on your best face, she's putting on his best face, her best face, and so on. Uh, but there should be some level of interaction where you, you have some understanding of who the other person is, and not ending up with somebody completely different once you, you actually start marriage. And what I was uh, pointing to uh, that um, a, a lot of the imma now that they require uh, a couple of meetings with the imam before uh, couples get married, and I think that's helpful. And I think a lot of times you guide couples in that direction, that you know, just kind of the general advice is before marriage and making sure that they understand each other. So, tell them for the kids' generation, then we'll have, now we'll be experienced and tell them, and then we'll have some safeguards, inshallah. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I was somebody asked me, "What do you? Where are you going later today?" So I talk about marriage. 
And of course, we're here to learn from you as well. Um, but they said, you know, do people, it was, it was an older woman, and she said, uh, do people really go to these things, you know, these marriage seminars? Can, can somebody really benefit from it? Everybody comes into a relationship, they don't change, she's a little bit sour. And I said, you know, subhanAllah, people who really fear Allah SWT, they will, doesn't have to come to a marriage to talk, but they will be concerned. Am I doing the right thing? You know, am I pleasing Allah SWT? Even if you're making mistakes, even if you fall into that people of me, you would be the type of person to be um, uh, ready to accept advice. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to implement everything. Maybe you'll catch one thing tonight. Maybe I'm going to catch one thing tonight. And I'm going to go home and try to work on that. And that that's the beauty about Islam. When we understand this concept of taking account of yourself, it's not just me and how is my prayers five times a day and my, my uh, did I complete Hajj or not or did I pay again? But it's also in how do I interact with other people? You know, Allah SWT is going to hold me accountable for that. It's not just my relationship with Allah SWT. Alhamdulillah, every time you know I'm in Salah, I'm wonderful, but I go and I'm backbiting and I'm angry and I'm mean, I'm putting other people down, I'm nice to people outside of the home, and then I come and dump on my spouse and on my children. And the dog, do you have it? They're in the back here. Um, <laughs> this concept of keeping, uh, you know, holding yourself accountable is really important, and this should push ourselves to constantly better ourselves in all aspects of life, and particularly in marriage. Um, this, this ayah, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu taqullah, wa tamtum nafsum ma qaddamat lighat, wa taqullah. I believe it's the only ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be conscious of Him, be fearful of Him, be mindful of Him, um, where He says it before the concept and right after the concept, right? Which obviously means in between those two times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have taqwa, pay attention to what's in the middle, right? What's in the middle here? Well, tell them nafsum ma qaddamat um, every soul should pay attention to, for what it's putting forth for tomorrow. In other words, be mindful of your time and how you use it, how you spend it, and what you do with it. The most amount of time that we spend with anybody is with our families, right? Is with your family. So that private life of yours, um, let it be right. Be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that time. Uh, like she's, like uh, Lubna said, uh, you know, many people put on a very good face outside the house, but inside the house there's somebody else, right? Don't be that person. Be uh, be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everywhere you are, in between closed doors, uh, in private, even with yourself, right? When you're sitting in front of the TV and watching the TV by yourself and what you're allowing to yourself to see, when you're sitting with your wife alone, with your kids alone, uh, or whatever it is, uh, that you should you should be just as mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there than when you are outside in public and you know obviously in public we all straighten up and we try to put on a nice clothes and you know you're more conscious of what you do but Allah says everywhere all the time. I just wanted to touch upon you know the concept uh, sometimes it can be a source of conflict in marriages you know what are the rights and duties of spouses and, uh, and I think usually, uh, I don't want to be uh, stereotypical, but it can tend to be a more of an issue, uh, perhaps, of uh, men's expectations of what women should be doing, um, and the misunderstanding of, of you know, household chores and household responsibilities. As a panel, we're coming upon a time where many households have dealt two people working in the home. Uh, and unfortunately, and I think this happens uh, more so people who have a lot of cultural expectations, uh, where the man will still, this can be an, an issue, uh, where men can still expect that, okay, well, the woman should be at home and take care of the, the children and all the house duties. Um, that cannot be the same when both people are working. And again, all of this is with compromise and with understanding. You know, talking about what do you like to do, what do I like to do, what do, I, what do we do best, and let's work on that together. Whether the husband is at home and the wife is working, or the woman is at home and the husband is working, that has to be a constant conversation. It's nothing, uh, I'm using uh, so much words, it's something that's black and white. You have to do this, otherwise you're not a good husband or you're not a good mother. Uh, I, I, I want to just make sure that uh, there's no misconstruing uh, of yeah. that concept. The man is responsible for the yeah. household financially, right? That's yeah. understood. 
I didn't want that to be yeah, yeah, sorry. lost in the yes. yes, alhamdulillah. That's one good, uh, uh, you know, thing that's the, so one thing that's, that's, that's there that's uh, firm, that a man cannot shirk his responsibility, a financial responsibility to the home. Again, there's a layoff or something else, that's, that's, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But for someone to say, no, I'm going to be home, you have to go work, that's not there. The man is responsible for that. Um, so again, right to duties and spouses in terms of you know household chores, that has to be something flex. Um, any other thoughts on this? Of course, there are the rights uh, upon one another, of course, is to treat each one uh, with respect, to keep the guard the secrets of each other, not to like, expose them on the outside. You know, with this world of Facebook uh, and Twitter, people are exposing a lot about their families. And, and, and subhanAllah, even, this is just my advice, this is kind of stepping aside a bit, but your family is sacred. You know, what you and your husband do, uh, you and your wife, you and your spouse, what, what, what you do, where you go, you know, when you put it out there, realize that people look at that and they're like, wow, they're going here, they're going there, and they're always happy. And you know, people, so they, yeah, they get envious, they get jealous. Because maybe, you know, maybe I just had a fight with my spouse, and all of a sudden somebody posts, Oh, look what my husband gave me, double, you know, two dozen roses, and we went to this restaurant, and you're like, ah. You know, it, it makes people feel bad, right? And at the same time, you know, um, it's also creating a false reality that everybody's happy all the time. You know, somebody might have just fought, and they posted that picture. Not to say that somebody cannot have an awesome relationship all the time, but guard that. You know, and, you know some things are a gem. Alhamdulillah, you don't have to always put it out there. This is something uh, precious. Always ask about spontaneous how to put baraka in it, and you don't want uh, to create that, that constant cycle of envy. I know people that have left Facebook for years because they felt themselves always envious of other people, vacations, children, uh, all, all kinds of good things that happen. So, uh, our, um, our Prophet uh, he taught us that to share private matters of the home, particularly intimacy, is something that is absolutely forbidden, right? You're not allowed to talk about uh, affairs of intimacy outside of your home with your with your spouse and an extension of that is your romantic relationship right it's uh, it, it's not uh, the exact same as intimacy but what she's talking about you know people fo posting nowadays on social media uh, look what my husband got me and you know that type of dialogue that's something for you and your your spouse alone that's not to be shared with the whole world um, to have that, value it, uh, enjoy it, but between you and him, why does anybody else in the world uh, need to know about? I think that's a very, very important. Uh, you, you don't know what type of effects that can have on your own selves and on others. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, um, uh, he told us, "Istainu ala qadaih bil kitmat." Right, <laughs> that um, uh, seek help in the fulfilling of your duties with secrecy, with privacy. Um, do your stuff and don't tell the whole world about it. Right? Why does the whole world need to know about what you and your husband, where you went on vacation, or what you did, and this, and posting it out literally to the whole world? Right? That is not, um, there's no benefit in that. There's no benefit in that. If somebody can come up to me afterwards and give me a benefit, I'm willing to listen. But um, it does a thousand times more harm than it will do uh, help. So that, that's very, very important. This issue, of, by the way, of rights and duties of spouses and Islam, and stuff, it's a big topic. It's not a small topic. We just we glossed it over. Um, and oftentimes this is a point of contention uh, when husband and wife struggle um, because one party says this is what you're supposed to do and the other party this is what, says what you're supposed to do. Those kind of um, negotiations, so to speak, when people get stuck on them, you should seek some, you know, some uh, mediation to help you with that, right? Whether that be uh, going to someone who's learned, a family member, a counselor, or whoever it may be. Um, but that that issue of rights and duties is a big is a big uh, uh, um, dividing point where people misunderstand what I'm supposed to do as a woman, what I'm supposed to be the husband, 
And uh, so, so we didn't want to leave that, you know, and without making that point. Sure. Yeah. I have a quick question, or yes. um, uh, maybe it's an assumption, but individuals or, let's say, sisters or brothers that do post spouse information or their married couple of information, um, could it be because of a sense of um, insecurity or wanting to be recognized or a sense of low self-esteem or something of that nature? Absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. That could be a process where the husband and um, wife can talk about, you know, what, uh, I don't know, like, have a discussion about that. Why is it? Am I not doing enough? And, you know, reassuring her or him. That's a very good point. I mean, he's looking into the psychology of why, you know, somebody would post about their their intimate relationship or or about what my husband got me or this and that the other. Does that show some insecurity about the other partner's uh, uh, side? And yeah, perhaps it does. Allah um, ta'ala And should, you know, should those discussions and should that... And I'm really curious, you know, subhanAllah, when people make those postings, to that gratitude that they're showing publicly, do they really do they really reflect that back on their spouse? You know, do they really thank them and do they really appreciate them, and and you know and show them uh, in, in in with love and care and affection um, to the same extent that they just throw out in the public sphere. So. Um, and I think that's interesting because I think we're bringing that up. It's a very good point, and I think that speaks to um, uh, why do you use social media in general. Right? I mean, I, I'm guilty of it sometimes, you know, I post things, um, I wouldn't say like intimate, uh, alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, you know, personal relationship stuff, but, um, you know, why do people use social media in general? So it may not even just be, why did she post, oh, you know, we did this together, or we went to this restaurant for, you know, what have you. But in general, I mean, subhanAllah, uh, it feeds the ego, right? And this is something really to be guarded. And I'm telling you from personal experience, and I'm sure all of you have felt that at some times. You know, it, it, Facebook is tricky. Twitter, all those kind of things. You know, what? why are you posting? Just ask yourself. Just like we have to guard our tongue, this is another means of communication. Why am I posting this? Uh, uh, um, you know, what is the benefit? Am I going to harm anyone? Ask yourself that. And, and again, all of us can be uh, guilty uh, of this at one point in time. So something to think about. It's not just about personal relationship, about anything that you post, you know, personal. Um, communication. Super key, uh, subhanAllah, key to a successful marriage is having communication. And what does that mean? Um, by the way, it's interesting, I think there's a, um, a, a fact that 90%, it's kind of high, 90% of communication is actually nonverbal. Mm -hmm. Nonverbal, what does that mean? So somebody you know, who's you know, very straightforward in their speech and whatever, does not a very flowery, they say, you know, well, I didn't say something. But their face is like this, or they're like this. Or I didn't say anything, you know. But the, all the white language. What did I? What did I just show you? I showed frustration, disinterest, or what have you. So that's really interesting. That's really important to understand how each spouse communicates. You know, understand is somebody more verbal? Is somebody more nonverbal? Um, what are the cues? Uh, understanding how you speak. Maybe you don't under, understand that you give certain cues. I think that's so true. But I think just even with. You know, any relationship, people like to use this a lot to kind of pre or assume um, how the other person is feeling. And I feel like that could that can go two ways. Like somebody's body language might seem angry, upset, but then really the other person is just like, "Oh, I'm totally okay." And then Absolutely. that becomes blown up. And, it's just and, it, and it takes time. That's a very good point. And it takes time, but with time, you know your partner's body language and what it means, right? Everybody has a different wavelength. Um, so my when I smile, I smile like this, or that's a big smile for me. I'm being honest, but when she smiles, you see how she smiles, right? But when you know each other, you understand those parameters. So even you're a right, smirk is good. Smirk you're, is good. You're right. You're right in what you're saying, but it comes to a point when your relationship is solid and you still you will understand each other's cue. But yeah. but it's a good point. You should always inquire. Yeah, subhanAllah, very important. Uh, and again, a lot of this is understanding yourself. So when you understand yourself, you can understand yourself, oh wow, it's different. So then there's some understanding there. Um, these are kind of not really in any particular order, but between husband and wife, subhanAllah, in the beginning, you feel like you have all the time in the world. As work gets more uh, uh, busy, life gets busy, you have in-laws, you have family, you have children, hello, 
that like a big time, you know, especially this age. All of you guys, this age of children, you know, you want to start talking, they're like, mommy, and they sit right in between you, or daddy, and then, you know, you don't even get a chance to talk. And a lot of times that, that's a source of friction. Not spending enough time with each other, it's very interesting. It's actually a source of friction so that when you do have a few minutes, you start fighting. It's like, it doesn't make sense. Actually, you're fighting because you actually miss each other, and you even haven't had a chance to have quality time. So you start picking up the surface things, nitpicking. That's why, you know, married couples bicker a lot. But in reality, you haven't had that good quality time to spend with one another. Uh, so make appointments with each other, you know, at whatever stage of life. Make an appointment. You may think, oh, but we're home, we're retired. We're, I see you every day. Make a lunch appointment. Let's go out, you know, Tuesday, let's go out. Let's do this special thing. So it changes the flow. You know, when you, when, when, when you guys are younger, you have kids, you know, say, hey, every night or maybe once a week, whatever it is, we're, it's just going to be you and me. But no phone, no Facebook, no email, you know, unless it's an emergency, we're not, you know, we're putting that aside. Put the kids to bed and enjoy each other. Even sometimes it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you felt like maybe you got some of the house business done, hey, did you pay this bill? No. Car, what's going on? Job. You know, but then you actually get to like talk about fun stuff. Could be something even at that level. So that's very important. Understanding the emotion behind the words. Somebody just came home from work. Somebody had a bad day at home, whatever it is. And someone is raging, you know, it takes a lot of maturity and it takes a lot of <clears throat> what, you know, calmness within the other person to be able to say, I know they're not mad at me, I'm going to let this go. <laughs> I'm not going to say, why are they yelling at what happened, right? You, you're, you're understanding that someone else is having a bad day has nothing to do with you. And that takes a lot of um, practice. It's tough. To do that, but that's really important, and that's that's part of that mercy, right? That's part of that. You know, that and adding to that is your expectation. In my case, like used to travel a lot. When he would come home, he was exhausted from traveling from working. I he wanted me to recognize his effort. I was exhausted from taking care of the kids and all of that. I was like, I should be treated like that queen, and he should, thought he should be treated like the queen. Right. I couldn't get to it that totally point, you know, like. So it's a lot of what you expect from the other person and how to get to that middle. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it really is. No, but that's a perfect example. Mark, and it's all comes to the experience. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah, you, you live through it and then you Oh, you <laughs> Right, absolutely. So it's that maturity, not to rush and be like, oh my god, this is horrible. Yeah, it's good. That's the thing, we fall into blind communication. Everyone thinks, like every other part, Things that they need to be heard, they need to be like it, the other one is. It's like sometimes you just feel like if you could switch the, you know, positions, like you'll be on the other side and the other person will be on the other side. Maybe you'll be understood. That does right? help. Yes, that does help too. By the way, mm -hmm. you know, especially with stay-at-home situations. You know, uh, um, um, I, I found that with myself that a lot of times something I felt like I wasn't being understood or yeah. or, or maybe. And it's not the fault of the other person, they just haven't experienced that. Then when you switch roles, it doesn't even have to be for a long time, it could be for just a day, half a day. A couple of hours. Yeah, a couple of hours. You really do get to appreciate. And imagine if you came home from traveling and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, there's expectations, whatever, you're like, okay, you know, I, you, you totally get it when you switch. I, I, I. Um, so we talk about nonverbal communication. Setting up rules, this is very difficult for me, not to interrupt the other person. Uh, you know, especially when you're trying to be heard. You're, you're really trying to resolve a situation. You know, so you guys have to kind of set your rules for, for and, and, and try to find easy ways to remind each other. And this is also very tough to stick to, but blaming the other person, saying you always and you never, it slips, nobody's perfect. But it automatically puts the person on the defensive. You say, you know, I'm having a tough time in understanding this. Or, you know, I really felt hurt when this happened yesterday. So it is still talking about a situation that your spouse is involved in, you're but you're not automatically eye. saying you. You're using the I. You're using the I. It's, it's a very, it sounds really um, technical, but honestly, it, it doesn't put somebody on the defensive right away. It really helps to kind of separate the person so they can be a little bit subjective. It's such a small thing. Sorry, objective as much as possible. And then when the other person is talking, we understand that some people, and it doesn't have to be between men and women, sometimes it's not just a gender thing. Some are more talkative than others. Some really want to be understood. Maybe even if you know one is more talkative than the other, maybe the, the one that's less talkative has an issue and you're just tired or whatever, but you want to you want to make the other person feel like they're being heard. So show them that you're listening, right? Don't doodle. This is deadly to conversation. 
Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Just stop. You know. And sometimes you need to remind the other person, please stop. I need your attention. Like, listen to what I'm saying. So don't interrupt by picking at your fingernails, doing the phone. Have a real conversation and pick the right time. Don't do it in the middle of dinner when the kids are screaming. Somebody has to go to the bathroom. There's an alarm going off. You know, don't pick the wrong time for an important conversation. Um, and, and again, to try to remember not to raise your voice in front of uh, other family members. Some people have joint family situations or in front of children. It's not really sending uh, the right message to them. So I'm up next. Sure. So sorry. Uh, it seems like <clears throat> there was one that I actually came across, which was um, if there's a moment of emotional distress between the husband or spouse, the husband or the spouse can say, "Let's take a five minute break," and or "Let's talk about this tomorrow." Um, I know that was in there, and sometimes it's better to just uh, be patient, and the next day or a lot more calmer even. Yeah, different couples have different ways of communicating. So you have to figure out what works. So some people, it can drive the opposite party nuts if you tell them, you know, if you walk out the door, right? Um, it's the worst form of disrespect. For another couple, that may be a good thing, and it works for them, right? So you have to find out what works for you. And when things get really heated and really bad, what do you do? You know, what do you, and you can talk about that a little yes. at calm times, you know what? When, because it happens, it's going to happen. It, uh, those converse, those arguments, those uh, fights, is part, that's part of marriage, right? But also regulating and making sure that there is some semblance of, uh, uh, yeah, some what? Decency. Decency, right, that's the right word to those conversations that's still important. So you, couples have to figure out there's no right formula for for any, you know, one black and white formula for everybody. So would you say prevention plays a key role, like prevention and letting, you know, before you get into the marriage or conflict, you guys are already discussing, okay, if uh, both of us are very, very distressed, um, you know, this is the plan we're going to go with. And you're, you know, because I know in, in the health field, uh, the mental health field, they talk about prevention. Yeah. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Don't wait till the onset, yeah. but work on the prevention. And I'm wondering if that's something... It, it that may. I mean, it's, it's good to have ground rules. You know, also when you do, when you talk about meetings and having, dealing with uh, different sorts of uh, um, mediations or, you know, conflict, there has to be ground rules, right? And so we're talking about that too. So sometimes you have to get into it. You know, there's not much of an option, but you can't, we can't cross these boundaries, right? And when you cross these boundaries, you completely disrespect me, and that's not acceptable, right? So, um, and what those boundaries are, they, there's a negotiation. And it's good for husband and wife to know each other at that level. It's important because marriages will break over those uh, undiscussed boundaries, right? You disrespect me beyond anything. I'm done. We're done. You know, no. If you understand the other person, and it can save a lot of that headache, right? Yeah. So, and I think we'll open it up for questions now. It's, it's, we have one more question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so, how do our kids sort of be glossing over it? You know, that remember that they're an amenda from Allah, uh, Allah SWT, make sure that we spend quality time. And that's part of a healthy marriage, right, is, is your kids as well. Um, sharing the responsibilities of the kids, um, discussing expectations. And again, remember that you're modeling to your children how to be a good husband and wife. So, you know, you want to make sure as much as you can that you are modeling that in the way you communicate, in the, uh, um, keeping your dirty laundry, you know, private as much as you can and what have you. Um, there's another, uh, we did want to talk about intimacy as an extremely important aspect of marriage, and I don't think it's discussed enough. Uh, again, we're not going to go into details, uh, but, but it's important to, to, to really uh, talk about this issue. Uh, uh, let me say, let me, let me give the um, summary of this issue in, in one, you can read the points there. Uh, I was in a counseling session the other day, I was counseling um, someone, and uh, this woman, um, uh, we have an intake form at the agency I work with. Uh, we have an intake form that's standard that we take people's information, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so when it comes to marriage issues, you know, there's different questions. One of them is on intimacy. So I said uh, to her, you know, I said, I'm sorry about this question, this sensitive question. Um, how is the intimate relationship between you and your um, husband? And her answer was, uh, to me was, you know, thank you so much for asking, uh, Sheikh um, Dr.